And as is traditional with the conference here, um, we will kick off with an update from the leadership team at the Council. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome the leader of Portsmouth City Council, Councillor Gerald Vernon-Jackson. And in a break with tradition, Councillor Vernon-Jackson will be giving a brief update and will also be taking questions from the floor. So please, if I can get you, ask you to get your, your pens and paper out as he's going through his presentation um, for questions at the end. Gerald, thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody, and thank you very much indeed for coming. Um, first of all, my thanks to, to Steph um, Shaping for, for getting this organised, uh, for Andy from the Guildhall for hosting us, and for, for Stuart for doing the legwork and getting the conference organised. Uh, so thank you very much indeed for all of you. So, I, so I'm going to do something slightly different um, today. So I'm going to try to take the theme of your conference and give you some information about the people of the city so that you've then got something that, that you can chew over over the sessions later in the day. Uh, also, a few bits and pieces about things that the City Council is doing. Uh, and finally, I'm, I'm happy to take questions from people. Um, I've been leader of the council. I think I'm in my 15th year as leader of the council. So most things in the city are my fault. Um, so, um, so I'm happy to answer questions. I'm, I'm sorry to say I'm not staying for the rest of the conference. My, my husband has been having chemotherapy um, and therefore doesn't have much of an immune system. Um, and um, no immune system, high levels of covid and not a great mixture. Uh, and I told him I married him for his pension, not his will. Um, um, so, lovely picture of the city. Um, just a bit about uh, the, the, the population of, the, uh, of Portsmouth. Uh, we did have a population um, in 1951 uh, of about 250,000. We then went down um, to 180, but we're now back up to 215, so we have a growing population. Um, and we, get, we have quite a young population in comparison with many other places, and that has an effect on some of the other slides that I've got for you uh, later. Um, in terms of the socioeconomic, the, the, the richer bit is the darker colours, uh, South Sea and the east of the city. Uh, the lighter colours, the areas of, of less wealth, centred around the city centre. Um, we've got an ethnic... Um, we've got a fairly small ethnic minority population and, and we're different from many other cities in that the ethnic minority population is spread all over the place. We don't have any areas of concentration, uh, which I think is a, a, a real strength. Um, but we, we do have in the south of the city more, but it, it, it's, we're a very, very united, um, diverse city. Uh, and I think that's an enormous strength that we've got. Um, health issues, and this is a... Uh, this is, tells you a bit about health inequalities. The darker the colours, the worse health inequalities there are. The lighter the colour, the better. Um, it, the, the, the difference in life expectancy um, has improved a bit. It used to be that if you lived in the city centre, you died 10 years earlier than if you'd lived in Drayton and Farlington. That's down to 7.8, but that's still a, um, a, a very, very bad um, uh, uh, idea in terms of equality of, of people's life opportunity. That's 7.8 years less that people have to spend with their kids and their grandchildren. Um, vaccinations are interesting. Um, again, it is the darker the colour, the higher proportion that we've got of people who've had vaccinations. Um, so Portsmouth has got about 10 percentage points lower vaccination than the national average. Now, I'm told that's not unusual for a city and a city of, of younger people. So our areas of problem um, tend to be younger men, so people under the age of 40, some people from the ethnic minorities, uh, and people who, who are less well off. Um, and so we're doing a lot of work to try to address that. So we've been, um, uh, we're doing lots of work in Paul's Grove and then in Summerstown this last week with pop-up vaccination centers. But also we were welcomed by the Chinese Association to their headquarters um, and to the mosque this week as well. Um, so we're doing lots to try to address that. For me, the worry is um, school pupils, where they have by far the highest proportion of people who are testing positive for COVID. Um, we've got a, a group of about 30 to 40 percent of, of secondary school pupils who could be vaccinated but don't have parental consent to do so. So we're trying to work with those parents to see, is that a thing that they don't like the vaccine, or is it the parents who just don't fill in any forms? Um, and therefore, if we help them to do that, we'll get that done. 
but the way in which we can get out of the pandemic and the effect on it is, is the vaccination program and we need, we're working as hard as we possibly can. Um, I think there's lots of other things that we can say that are great about the city. It's, it's great to see JJ in full finery here from the Royal Navy. Um, uh, and the Navy is one of the things that, that I think people are enormously proud of here. It makes us so different. The football club is, is really important as well, seafront. Uh, and, and to be considered as a great, the best entrepreneurial city in the country last year uh, shows the strength of our economic power. Uh, we're a great uh, powerhouse in terms of the national economy, uh, and we need to keep doing that. Just a few things that, um, that we're doing uh, as, a, as City Council. Um, we're doing food waste recycling. Uh, we're going to roll that out across the whole of the city. We're only the second council in Hampshire to, to do that. Um, and that's making an enormous difference in terms of our recycling rates. So when it's across the whole city, we expect over 5,000 tonnes a year of food to be, in, uh, to be collected. And uh, we're, we're planning to build our own anaerobic digester um, to be able to take that, but also from other councils as well. Um, we're buying the Tricorn site in the city centre. I'm sorry to say I have got fed up with seeing that abandoned land. We've already bought the Sainsbury's site um, and we're buying the Tricorn site. These, the Tricorn site's been left empty as a car park by the private sector owners for years. Uh, and I think we, one of the things the council can do is to step in in areas where there's private sector failure uh, and market failure and try to turn that story around. So we're buying it so that we can have a comprehensive redevelopment of the city centre and to get on with it and get it done. Uh, I've just lost patience. Um, so the port master plan is going to be really, really important. The port is changing what it's doing. Um, increasingly large numbers of cruise ships are wanting to use Portsmouth. Um, we've got a, a levelling up fund grant from the government, which is incredibly uh, valuable to us to be able to build a cruise terminal. And the, the cruise ships that we're aiming for are the high-end boutique um, part of the uh, market, not competing with Southampton with the huge ships they have there, but the people who are prepared to spend £10,000 for two weeks on a ship um, are the sorts of people we're targeting. And, and if we can get them to stay in the city, visit the city, um, that's enormously important as well. Um, so uh, we're, we're building new council housing. We have a real problem in terms of the amount of, uh, uh, of people who need somewhere decent to live. Um, but we've got to the point where we're now buying back council flats that have been sold off. And we bought 395 back into the, into the public sector so that families have got somewhere to live. And it's actually significantly cheaper to have families living in a, in, a, in a place we bought back as opposed to paying for them to be in bed and breakfast, which is a, a terrible place to bring up children. Uh, so there's lots and lots going on across the city. Um, and just one more thing that I thought you would be interested in. Uh, we are going to be the first council anywhere in the southeast of England to not just have a financial budget coming forward, but we're going to be the first council in the southeast to have a carbon budget this year because we need also to address not only the financial pressure but also the, 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 um, the pressure in terms of the climate emergency. So those are a few of the headlines of things that we are doing. Um, and Oh, no, beg your pardon, sorry. Next slide. Um, so done the vaccinations. Schools are really important. 91% of our schools are now good or excellent, according to Ofsted. Uh, the issue we've got, and it's the Portsmouth paradox, is we got incredibly... Uh, Ofsted says our schools are absolutely wonderful, but our results don't reflect that. So our results are still not as good as they should be, even though the schools have been incredibly well rated. Um, we've bought the theater, new Theatre Royal to protect it from becoming a nightclub. Um, uh, when I started on the council almost 20 years ago, one of the first things we did was to stop the King's Theatre becoming a Weatherspoons. So it seems to be a, a bit of a theme. Um, uh, and we'll be... Um, this, coming, this year, we will be celebrating Falklands 40 with a big parade um, down in Old Portsmouth, um, uh, Armed Forces Day and the Platinum Jubilee with lots and lots of, of street parties around. So they, again, I think I don't have another slide. There we are. Any questions? I hope that was of some interest. Any questions? Hello. Yes. Hello. Hi there. I'm Salwan Lai, Wheeler and Lai Chartered Surveyors. And with the city centre redevelopment, uh, 
how extensive would it be and when is the proceed rollout? So <clears throat> the land that we either own or will own is from Sainsbury's going down, down south and that's going to be the centre of the area for redevelopment. So the Sainsbury's, which is we've got a current use as um, a skate park, um, which I'm sure keeps lots of youngsters very happy, um, uh, that will go and we will probably develop from Sainsbury's going down south. There is an argument we start from the Cascades and move north, but... That may be more difficult. Um, but, but in terms of thinking of the city centre, we're, we're looking at the area from the access road into Trafalgar Gate, um, Princess Anne Way, um, where there's a scrapyard, all the way down, um, down further down to here, down to Winston Churchill Avenue. So trying to think about it as a whole area, not just pockets. And so we've just got a huge amount of money, over two million quid from the government, to be able to redo uh, Victoria Park and enhance that. So it's a whole city centre area. But in terms of the council operating as a developer, we'll primarily start at the top around the Tricorn and the Sainsbury site. Yes. Now, Tristan, Tristan works for the council. He asks me questions most days. <laughs> he might be asking for a pay rise. Hi, councillor. Um, regarding the Sainsbury site, the USP project's just gotten off the ground and they're redeveloping now. And uh, will you be starting development on the Tricorn site before you move to the Sainsbury site? So I'm not sure which way we're going to do it round. We're going to have to look to see what the ground, ground works are like, what, um, what the facility are like, and, and where... Because we won't be able to do this on our own. We can be the landowner, but we're going to work with the private sector developers. But we'll work with private sector developers to get it done not as private sector owners who sit there in land bank and don't do anything. Um, so we will work, but we'll... And, and we've got to be realistic. We, we, don't, we don't know everything about um, land development. We, it, over the next 15 years, the council's going to be the biggest developer in the city, but we will work with our colleagues to try to make sure that we do it right and learn from their, from their professional expertise. So I don't know the order we're going to do it, but we'll be guided by them. Oh, Penny. Hi. Penny, can you, use, can you hold the mic? I can't hear it otherwise. It doesn't work. Mic's not working. Is that better? Ah, yeah. Yay! Great. Wonderful. Might be helpful, Gerald, for you to just say a little bit about um, about nine million of that levelling up money, which is going to the Lido redevelopment yep. and the Linear Park. Yep. Because I think this is... It's a tremendous opportunity for jobs and just to lift quality of life in that part yep. of uh, Portsmouth and surrounding area. But also many organisations can use that new facility as a platform to deliver services um, across the generations. I just think more people know about that opportunity, the better. Thanks. Penny, you said it very well yourself. And I think um, it's, it's, again, it's a really good example of, of people working well together. So, um, Penny is the MP in Portsmouth North and the City Council working together to get that levelling up um, funds award of 20 million quid. Really, really good. So, uh, Penny, as Penny has said, there's um, going to be a huge amount of investment in the Lido to transform it, to make it a completely different place. And I'm sure Penny will be able to wax lyrical about that, but it's going to be an enormous opportunity. So it's not just rec recreating things as they were, but an entirely new facility for lots of different community things happening in the north of the city. And the linear part to connect all the way through the lines, um, the Hilsey lines, and the um, uh, defences of the city that there were, uh, and then down to the port to be able to do the... Um, to do the new passenger um, terminal for the cruise industry. So really good. And, and again, um, I think we work, when we work together, things are, are, are really good. So in the same way as, as Penny and the council have worked together on that levelling up fund, um, the, um, the, the way in which people work together to be able to oppose the Aquind uh, application was great. Penny campaigning uh, from within government as a Conservative MP, Stephen Morgan campaigning from opposition's benches uh, and the City Council providing a quarter of a million quid um, to be able to uh, get the specialist lawyers and planners working together worked really, really well. And, and we succeeded and it shows how well, if we work together, how, well, how much we can achieve for the city. Hayden. Yes, yeah, so you, no you normally do. <laughs> Oh, 
uh, in the north of the city. So, so, so pleased that we've been able to make that happen. Uh, my question, Gerald, is about the ongoing frustrations with the uh, sewage remittance into the, into the, the water, yep. uh, the uh, ongoing frustrations that people feel in the city about Southern Water's action on that. And I know it's not just a council issue, but what is the council doing to really apply pressure and try and find a solution to this? Well, I think the problem is basically Southern Water don't, don't care and they don't have to. Um, we all have to pay their bills um, when they come through our letterboxes or through into our um, email trays. Um, so um, I think the problem is particularly bad here. Uh, there is, a, there is a, a real issue that when it rains very hard in the, on the northern side of the city, up, up on the escarpment from Portsdown Hill, uh, the water runs off very, very fast, and we've got a combined sewage system and rainwater system. So when it rains really, really hard, Southern Water have got quite a difficult decision to make. Do they allow people's homes to flood with what they call stormwater and what we would call dilute sewage? Or do they open their emergency floodgates so that that water goes into Langston Harbour at the north of the harbour untreated? Now, that's a tough decision. Now, I think there's a really simple answer that they've been avoiding for years, which is that uh, all the sewage from the north of the city has to then come down the eastern interceptor sewer um, down to um, Eastney, to the pumping station. It then gets pumped back up to Bud's Farm in Haven to be processed, and then pumped back down um, to Fort Cumberland and then out to, out to the sea on the, the long outfall sewer. Um, if there was a connection so that the uh, stormwater that from the north of the city went direct to Bud's Farm, it didn't have to come all the way to Eastney and then be pumped all the way back up again, that would release a lot of the pressure and it would mean that those stormwater, um, stormwater events wouldn't have to happen. But there is also evidence, and, and we've all seen the drone footage, of southern water deliberately pumping sewage into Langston Harbour. Now, they've got consents. When I've been to see them, and they were so proud to tell me, so proud. They were only having 10,000 sewage pumping things into, uh, into Langston Harbour every year. Um, and and that, was, uh, that was shocking that they could be so proud of doing such a terrible thing. So I don't think they would live in the world of reality. So I think there has to be huge pressure. So what we're doing is we're putting, um, at the request of the campaign group, um, uh, putting up um, live signage on the seafront so that people can see the alerts that are coming up. So if they're going to go swimming, they can, they can know, are they going to go swimming in the seawater or are they going to go swimming in sewage, um, to be blunt about it. So that you can get this on your phone, but, but actually um, for looking at the age profile of some of the people who do swim in the sea, they, smartphones are not them and therefore we will do that. But we also need to put pressure on Southern Water to clean up their act, and, and um, we will work with anybody and everybody. Um, but actually, my personal view is that the, the time for um, Southern Water just to be a private profit-making organisation that doesn't really care about local people is, is, is not, it's not right. And therefore, it's better if that came back to being a public institution um, and that that should be there to serve the needs of the people uh, and not just to make profits for um, industrialists in Australia. So we will keep putting pressure on them, um, uh, but until it becomes a, a public-owned thing in the future, um, there is some things that we can do with them and there are some things that we can't. Sorry, Hayden, and that's not a simple answer. But lots of things aren't simple. But I might be. I've, I've got... So, lady at the back, and then there's a lady indicating in the middle. Hi, Gerald. Um, Jane Barry from Liberty Recruitment. Three things that I just wanted to bring up was, firstly, Aquind. Um, I know that was mentioned, but I think it was really good that politically you collaborated yep. to get that stopped. I mean, that was admirable. The second thing, you mentioned about the tricorn, and there was mention about what's going on. When it was initially... Um, 
suggested that that was all going to be pulled up and there was going to be cafe culture and everything else. The, the flagship John Lewis was muted and I believe that was going to be sort of set up and they rejected it in the end. Yeah. But one, what's going to happen with that area? The second question I've got is um, with regards to South Sea, the centre there where John Lewis, Debenhams have all come out. It's still is starting to look really shabby. Um, and I suppose the fear is, will those shops that are currently there start pulling away? Because the more that it looks run down, the less people want to stay, I, I suppose. And it is really a central hub, I think, for yep. South Sea. And the other question <laughs> is um, Fratton and all down there. Down those shops, it just looks shabby. You know, there's a lot of empty shops there. Could we be doing something, you know, with pop-ups, just making it look more vibrant and actually occupied? Because I think what the pandemic has shown is people can do shopping online, but there's never going to be a replacement for some, especially the older generation in this city, to actually go and physically walk into shops and have a community. And I just think there's quite a lot of shops down in all those areas that could be utilised. Thank you. Thanks. A series of interesting and good questions. So just running through, through them in, in terms of the geographical bits of the city. So uh, I would love to have seen a, a large John Lewis here. Uh, my fear is that we would have built it and it would now be empty because they're pulling out of, of shops left, right and centre. And if they couldn't make um, the one in Knight and Lee in, um, work in South Sea an even bigger store, I'm not sure they'd have made work. And we would have had an empty store sitting there. Um, quite a lot of the BHS stores that went over five years ago across the country, they're still empty. There is not the demand for big department stores anymore. Uh, partly because of the rents that people charge. So the Debenhams in uh, the South Sea, their rent was a million a year. Um, Debenhams here in the city centre, two million a year. So landlords have been dragging in large amounts of money and, and shopping's changed. Um, there are people who, who, who want to go shopping physically. But actually, every single one of us who goes and buys something online is somebody who isn't buying something in a shop. And that, that, even if it's only 10%, that takes out the proportion that means that a shop is profitable or not profitable. And, and you can't expect shops to keep going if they're losing money. So I think in any redevelopment that we've got in the city centre, it won't be anchored on big department stores. Those, those days are gone in shopping. I, I wish they hadn't, except when I go shopping with my husband, um, uh, because he will spend lots of money. Um, but... But, but those days are, are gone. So a plan that worked, we thought worked 10, 15 years ago for the city centre is not right now. So um, the government have set us a target, which I think is far too high and is unrealistic, of, of building 17,701 new houses in the city over the next 15 years. It, it, in an island city, it's completely unrealistic. But the government rules say we have to see if we can find land for that. So in the city centre will be primarily residential, but with um, retail on the ground floor and, sh and, and residential above. And hopefully also um, cultural stuff as well to hold it so that the city centre becomes something that doesn't shut down at five o'clock. So that we've got things happening all the way through the, the evening as well in the city centre. So restaurants, cinemas, that sort of thing. Um, personally, I think it would be a great home for um, the Sherlock Holmes experience. We don't make nearly enough of Sherlock Holmes created here in Portsmouth, a worldwide character, and yet everybody just thinks of Baker Street, not here. And we need to do more. And we've got incredible collections here to do with Sherlock Holmes that we could show. So I think there's, that is going to be, could be a really interesting area. And we'd also aim, because on the western side of the city, we, we're quite short of public open space. So if we can create also a, an inner city park as well um, as part of that, so there's some more green space in the city centre, I think that would be, that would be really good as well. Um, looking at South Sea, I understand there is the potential for a new owner for the Debenham store um, uh, because it's been empty for far too long, and there is, an, as I understand it, a really interesting plan to pull 
um, the doctor's surgery from Ashburton Road into the ground floor there with a pharmacy and other shops and restaurants on the ground floor and residential above. Um, and there's a planning application in that's coming this week from the owners of the Knight and Lee um, uh, store um, for uses there, including a cinema. So lots of things happening there. Uh, on Fratton Road, um, the City Council are buying the Bridge Centre because, like you, I am fed up of all those empty shops. There are, if we can't get sh shops to want to be in there, there are masses of community groups who could be there making things happen. Um, so, um, so that's why we're intervening directly in the market to go and buy the Bridge Centre off ASDA, who kept it mainly empty for a, far too long, so that we can revitalise Fratton Road. So the council are being fairly interventionist in trying to make sure that we are transforming the city centre getting lots more shops open and active in Fratton Road. Um, and we'll continue to work on South Sea as well. So as a council, we are, uh, across all political controls of the council, we are a very interventionist council. We, we've kept all our council housing. When the government wouldn't build the motorway spur into Portsmouth, the council did. The M275 is, was built and owned by the council. Um, we've bought the port. We've created the port. We bought Portico shipping. So we are a very interventionist council and we'll continue to do that because we want to, be, we want to create the future of the city as a great future, not just rely on what the private sector might do. A lady in front of And then you're going to throw me out, Yvonne, are you? Yeah. It's the last question. Yvonne has is, 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 is got the, the button here and I'll disappear in a puff of smoke. So this young lady in the middle for the first, na last question. Well, thank you for the young. Uh, Fiona Heath, the Solent Celebrant. At the last Shaping Portsmouth, there were fabulous plans shown for Tipner. Has that been shelved? So, it's, uh, so on the east side of Tipner, there'll be development by Vivid and Bellway. Um, the council tried to get the government agency that owned quite a lot of it to sell that land to the city council so we could get on and get it developed. Um, but the government decided they didn't want to do it um, and therefore using their agency, which they call Homes England, but I call No Homes England, they've left it derelict. Um, now, they say they have a plan for a private developer to get on and do it. Um, it'll be great if it happens. If we'd been allowed to do it, it would have been developed out by now, but governments have very strange priorities at times. Um, and I think it's probably just the bit of land was too small for that agency to be concentrating on. They've got big areas. Um, on the western side of Tipner, there's been considerable political debate about it. So the question was, did we do we just redevelop the existing land mass that we've got there, which is really important for the economics of the city, because the, the pounds land at the north, where that crane is, etc., it's one of the very few areas on the Solent where there is access to deep water for companies to be able to develop and create jobs. So we'll keep that end of it for jobs and on the other side of the, uh, of the creek as well on Horsey Island. So we'll put in a new bridge to connect the two, two together. Uh, and, and that will happen. Uh, and we've also bought the old firing range so that we can, we can, um, we can use that. There was... Con Controversy about whether we would extend the size of the island, of, 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 of Tipner, um, by some land reclamation. We've done land reclamation across the city over time, so um, Lakeside is land reclamation. The, the, the tip next door to there is land reclamation. Milton Common is land reclamation. We can't build on it because um, if, you, if you try to build on it, it's filled with old fridges and old cars um, that are buried. Um, so. So in Portsmouth, we've done land reclamation, but, but it hasn't found cross-party political support to do that. So we're, we're not doing, we're just using the existing land. Um, and, and, and working with other parties means you have to listen to people. And that means that you have to change things over time. So we'll, we'll, we, will do re, um, we will have to do development on tip, no, on both east and west, but it won't be as big as it was, and it won't be... It won't have the facility, so there it, the development will be much smaller, so there won't be a school. There won't be some of those community things that, that were planned. Um, and it does mean that um, we're having to find space for an extra 2,000 houses somewhere else in the city. And that means they either have to go 
into the city centre, or into Cosham, or into Lakeside, or into St James's, um, if we're going to hit the government targets. So I'm sorry for quite a long, long answer, but, but it's quite a complicated issue. Um, but I hope that um, at Tipner we will see development finally. It, it's been derelict for years and years and years. I was talking to a friend of mine who used to break ships there, uh, naval ships, and he said, oh, well, we, just, we just took out the asbestos and buried it. Um, now, that's not a great thing in terms of a building site where you want houses with gardens for kids to be able to play in. So it, it, it's not a simple area. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I do hope you have a really successful remains of the conference, um, and thank you for everything that you do for the city. Uh, without you, this city would be infinitely poorer. So thank you very much indeed.